second. But before I, because I stand here before you, I just want to say if anyone needs a word from God, can we just take a moment to continue to minister God's spirit in this place? Continue to allow him to saturate our atmosphere. Because see, there's no place like a heart of faith party because a heart of faith party no stop. See, there's no place like a heart of faith party. Because when you come to heart of faith, we want you to know that you are loved. You are encouraged and you are supported. You know, church, I'm just so thankful to God that he put it on our bishop's spirit to, to begin this ministry here at Heart of Faith. Glory to God. We just want to give God a shout of praise right now. Because God put that on our bishop's heart to create this ministry. And I stand before you right now as a small person who is trying to deliver in the ministry of God. I'm going to go ahead and allow you to take your seat real quick. I just need to have a few moments with God. I just need to make sure that he takes me to the place that he needs me to be. And I stay in that place. I just want to stay committed to what God has given me to give you. Oh, merciful Father, right now I come to you with my bowed heads asking you, God, just keep me in your spirit. Lord, continue to allow your words to work through me right now, Heavenly Father. Lord, please keep any ill feelings or thoughts out of my mind right now, Lord, and just help me to deliver your word. Lord, I ask you for a sense of calmness as I stand before you. Lord, I'm truly thankful for this opportunity. It is such a beautiful thing to be able to deliver your word, Lord, and I just want to give it to your people as you gave it to me. Lord, just continue to minister to my spirit. Lord, you know that I'm up here and I'm doing my best and I know that I can just lean and depend on you. And I'm thankful for you right now, Lord. I thank you right now, Lord, for this opportunity. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God. You know, first, giving all honor to God and to my bishop and first lady, my, my heart is just full. And I just want to say, because there's a few people that have walked into this room that has just given me a sense of peace and I'm thankful for it. So Bishop, if you can give me just a moment just to acknowledge them because I want them to know that I see them and I acknowledge them. Tio drove three hours here to be with me. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. I appreciate that. You truly surprised me, but I always knew that I had you in my corner and I thank you for that. I thank you to my mother-in-law who gave up commitments that she had today to be here with me and I thank you for that. To my sister-in-laws and to my brother-in-laws, I see you, I thank you. Thank you for sharing this moment with me. And, and I had to reach into my first church and I pulled another friend out. Thank you, Angela. Thank you for being here. I truly am honored by your presence. I really am. And truly last but definitely not least to Demetrius Martin. She's always in my corner. I thank you. I thank you. From the moment I met you up until now, you are a true woman of God and I truly appreciate you. I truly appreciate each and every one of you for being here today, giving all praises to God. So today we're going to visit with one of our favorite scriptures. One we often see written on graduation cards, quoted to encourage a person who can't seem to find God's will. And sometimes we dole it out like a doctor explaining a prescription where he'll say, take Jeremiah 29 and 11 a few times with a full glass of water and call me in the morning because I think you'll feel better. So I'm going to ask that you stand with me real quick while we read our text. Our text is coming from Jeremiah 29 and 11. It's on the screen for you. If you have your Bibles, if you can turn with me there. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. Glory to God. You know, with this message here, this scripture, this really could be the entire message because God has delivered it all. He has. But I'm going to go ahead and allow you to take your seat. And if you just let me just give you my little Easter speech, as I like to call them, I won't hold you long. I, I truly won't hold you long. I don't think this verse quite edges out Philippians 4 and 13 because that's a notable life verse but I will say it may come in a close second I would guess the majority of you can quote it word for word and I also would guess that 99% of the time it has been memorized in the new NIV Bible the, the scripture here is such a beautiful promise from God it offers us assurance for the future in whatever circumstances we have today. 
This lets us know that God's people can trust God to change their tomorrow. It declares God's intimate relationship to the people. It leads us to believe that God isn't leaving his people out to dry like sheep amongst wolves. God is intricately involved in creating a new future. It brings a perspective of hope. Now, as much as I love this verse, I, I truly don't prefer the NIV translation, and I'm going to tell you why. Because when we look at that particular translation, our focus becomes drawn to two words. And those words are plans and prosper. See, it's like our mind is magnetically attracted to them. I'm afraid this preoccupation with these two words messes with the interpretation. Because when we focus on plans and prosper, our tendency is to limit our understanding of me and my future. See, quickly the verse becomes about God's specific plan for my life and my success. Then we take it to the extreme and we cherish this verse for the promise we think it makes about God is laying out every plan in our life. Like, where should I go to college? Who should I marry? What career path should I follow? How much success and wealth will I gain? But if I'm honest, but if I'm honest, and I take us off the path of what this verse is really trying to say. So let's look a little closer as to how it reads in the New Revised Standard Version. It says, for surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Now, let's place this popular verse in the context as to how God had delivered this to Jeremiah and the people of Israel. See, if we just read a few chapters before, we will realize that God's words were to a people that was hopeless. Yeah. Uh -huh. They were in exile. Yeah. They were completely stripped away from their homeland, the temple and their king. And see, to make matters worse, God instructed the people to serve King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon because he had exiled them to Babylon. And if they don't serve him, then God will punish the nation with the sword, with famine, and in pestilence. And says God, until I have completed its destruction by his hand. And see, God repeats this three times. Because what God was trying to warn the people is to ignore the promises given by false prophets. So a little background is that God had already delivered the people of Israel out of Egypt. Yeah. And as soon as he delivered them, what did they do? They turned back to false gods. And, they, and it's like God just kept delivering them and delivering them. And they just wouldn't cooperate. So he tried to warn them. And he told them that if you don't ignore the promises given by false prophets, diviners, or other religious persons, God says they will try to convince the people to give up obedience to King Nebuchadnezzar by telling lies. So... If I, if I put that in context, if that was me, I probably would have believed the false prophets because I didn't want to obey a king who stole my life. I was living good over there doing whatever I wanted to do. And now I'm placed over here and I'm trying to rethink my thoughts. See, that lie would have sounded a little better than reality to me. But see, God implored them to trust God's word. So then we go on to... Jeremiah 29 and 7, God's words are given. Seek the welfare of the city where I sent you into exile. Has God ever sent you away? Has God ever told you that you got to get away from the circumstances that you're in? And pray to the Lord on his behalf. And for in his welfare, you will find welfare. What? God's not promising to rescue them right now. They're the people of Israel. They're God's chosen people. God wants them to do the work of the city, holding them in captivity. See, they weren't used to that. Right, right. See, see, what God was trying to tell them was, trust me, I have everything under control. I know your situation stinks, but I know what I'm doing. I really do have your best interest in mind. God says, for surely I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. 
plans for your welfare. Not for harm, to give you a future with hope. So maybe Jeremiah 29 11 isn't about God's specific day-to-day -day plan for you. Instead, it is a message of hope to God's people, including you and me. God knows what's best for us. God will lead us in the direction of a new future. The lies of this world, though they may sound good, will not get us there. So my message title is, it's in the plan. It's in the plan. We know from the moment that we open our eyes, it's based on a decision. We decide to get up. We decide what to wear. We decide what to eat. We decided we were coming to church this morning. And when we walked in here, we decided where we wanted to sit and who we wanted to sit by. Those are decisions. Those are choices. Every moment of our waking lives, we're faced with decisions. However, most of the important decisions we make in life, we make with incomplete information. Most decisions often involve so many complicated factors that a complete analysis is not practical or even possible. So not only are we making decisions based on incomplete information, but more often, we don't even know what decision to make. So now I ask you to allow me to challenge you to three types of decisions. Now, I know I tend to tell you to put your technology away, but go and take it out. You can take some notes. I want y'all to hold these on for me because you're going to use these again in those eight keys. Come on back out on Wednesday. You're going to use these again because this is going to bring them back to you. Uh, the first type of decision is life adapting decisions. Those we make during the changing season. They require us to adapt to new cultures. So... This leads me to believe that this is what Paul was saying when he said that when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I believed as a child. But now I'm an adult. Childish things are no longer acceptable. Meaning we got to get it together. We got to release those petty ideas that keep us trapped in these seasonal commitments. See, see. Now, uh, the second one is life adjusting decisions. Huh. Those decisions I make about the activities of my life. Yeah. Opening up ways I can improve my life, like staying in school, going back to school, yeah. applying for a job, leaving a job, adjusting to your surroundings, taking risks, starting a business, yeah. removing ineffective people, and discovering their removal is just that an adjustment it's just an adjustment and see the last one is life altering decisions see decisions we make to change who we are how we perceive ourselves cleaning renewal knowing that we can never again be who we were before the decision so that takes me back to Paul he said in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, come on y'all Bible readers, any man who is in Christ, huh, becomes a new creature. All things pass away. Behold, all things become what? New. So see, that's a life altering decision because I gotta shake it off. I gotta step over it. You know, I gotta turn away from it. Those are those life altering decisions. Those decisions that's gonna take you out of that miry clay that you're in. Those decisions that's gonna say, I can't do you right now. I can't do this right now because I know that I got a gun that sits high and I gotta make some changes. You were seasonal. You were seasonal. And I have to leave you in that season. See, y'all keep dragging this stuff from one season to the next. And you wonder why your crops won't grow. Because you keep dragging all this weed with you. You keep dragging all these weeds with you. They were supposed to be left at the end of spring. See, I'm in fall now. I need to plant some seeds. Why am I dragging the weeds with me? Those dead flowers. Those are life-altering decisions. Now, stay with me, because I did say it was Easter speech. And so, I'm going to move forward a little bit, but I want to keep you connected, because every decision there, what?
consequences. Yeah, there are consequences for every decision that we make. So, if I make this about children for a few minutes, see, I done got too cute up here. I'm going to have to go back to the word. Because, see, this ain't going to work out for me. They cute, but I need to tell you the word right now. So, uh, in Newton's law, it says that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Come on, young people. You done heard the lesson. So, I tell my girls that there are always a consequence to your decision a reaction to the force so let, let's go back to the text for a minute because the children of Israel made all three decisions they made life adapted uh, they made life adjusting and then they had to make some life altering decisions so they made them all because they had to they started to listen to them false prophets and they started changing the course of what God had for them now now I, I wonder what they were thinking knowing that God was a jealous God knowing that God said don't put any come on now y'all read the Bible don't put nothing before me and despite the fact that they were all enjoying God's favor God's promises and blessings because he pulled them out of Egypt even in spite come on now of the blessings they continued to defy God and they became what we call spoiled Christians they keep asking for stuff and asking for stuff and not doing nothing with the stuff that they got they call spoiled Christians now I, I, I know I ain't got no spoiled Christians in here see see, they, they wanted a tree but they didn't want to plant the seed huh? but they wanted a tree so, so God removed his favor from them and they were taken into captivity by the Babylons for how many years come on y'all Bible readers 70 years so so there was some people there that weren't going to see God's promise. But that doesn't mean God didn't have his promise. Now, God said that the promise is there. Now, your generations may see it. It may not be yours, but the promise is there. Because God's word won't come back void. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Don't we know if God removes his grace and favor, we'll be in captivity? Don't we know? So, so my friends, I'm... I tell you, your decisions gonna impact your life. Equal and opposite reactions. Come on now, how many of us are facing struggles? Knowing we have bills we can't pay. Dealing with people we can't please. Facing addictions we can't kick. Buying stuff we can't afford. Trying to please people we don't even like. Come on now, this old life of ours is made up of decision after decision. Always presenting another problem to solve or a decision to make. So, 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 so while the people of Israel were going through this thing called life, God spoke a word of help and he hoped. For he says that, um, I know what's aimed towards you. I know the plan. I know the destiny because I know the end. Huh? I know the purpose. I know your why. I am the Alpha and Omega. I know all things. We have to understand that many things about life are uncertain. They're unexplained. And they're unpredictable. But God knows every intricate detail he is saying. That's why he said, I know God has a plan for you. I know we are still trying to get ourselves together. We're all working on some things. We're trying to get through some things. But he has a plan for you. Tell somebody he has a plan for you. See, see, come on now. Tell somebody he has a plan for you. See, 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 I, I know you're trying to make sense out of nonsense, but God has a plan for you. Even if you don't believe it, he has a plan for you. Even if nobody has told you, he has a plan for you. Yes, you with your bad habits, you with your secrets, you with your idiosyncrasies, your weird ways, your imperfections, your wrong choices, your bad decisions, your jacked up attitude, your one way thinking, your bipolar personality. Touch someone and say, God has a plan for you. Come on now. Come on now. Now, 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 Bishop, Bishop, I'm trying to, I'm trying to take this message to a close. You just know he has a plan for you. It's not a one size fit all. It was tailor made for you. It was tapered. It was chopped. It was tucked. It was made for you. Now, 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 I, I done been on this earth about four decades. And I've seen some things. Yeah, I've learned some things. Uh-huh. I misunderstood some things. I done forgot some things. But there is 
one thing I can be certain. But there will still be some things that will happen in my life. These things are not designed for me to understand them. They're not designed. These things are orchestrated by God to perfect our character, to allow us to grow in our faith in God. And to teach us how to lean and depend on Him. See, see, look at your neighbor and say, I don't know. I know you don't understand. I don't, don't, it doesn't make any sense, but it's God's plan. I know it don't look good right now, but the fact it didn't kill you, it didn't destroy you, I got you survived, is an indication that God is at work in your life. Come on now, come on now, stay with me. You may not understand everything God is doing, but whatever God is doing in this next season, somebody say he shouldn't be doing it without me. God, whatever you're doing in this season, don't do it without me. I'm going to say that again. God is about to do this in the next season. He's not doing it without me. See, one of y'all should have shouted right then. Somebody here should have shouted right now. See, see, uh, see, because I already know I have no reason to fear. I have no reason to fear. People going to disqualify you. People going to call you out. People gonna say you ain't worth nothing. But see, God has included you because he said I have a plan for who? Yeah, 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 somebody shout. He ain't doing it without me. See, see, Bishop, I, Bishop, Bishop, Bishop. See, I made up in my mind this next season that I'm gonna give my haters two choices. You can continue, you can continue to be a greater hater or you can be a celebrator because either way, God's got a plan for me. See, what God is doing for me in this next season, he's included me because it's in the plan. See, 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 you know the plan is simple. See, it's the process that y'all don't want. It's the process that's difficult. Bishop done taught this lesson. I'm just putting some icing on it. See, see, in the process, you gonna have some lonely days. Yeah, you're going to have some lonely days. You're going to have some lonely nights. you will going to have some bipolar moments. Ha, somebody say, in the process. In the process. In the process, you're going to have to deal with some so-called friends. Smiling in your face. Stabbing you in the back. And then asking you where the blood came from. Come on now. They asking you. See, see, see. You're going to have to see that. Uh, that these things are gonna happen, but you gotta trust that God knows what you need in expected place in your life. See, believing in God while reciting to God, you are taking me to an expected end. But to get you to the expected end, God gonna have to take you through a process. See, he gonna have to take you to a process. Cause see, God knows the right stimuli. He knows the right storms that will drive you to your knees, but it won't make you insane. See, see, God knows how long to keep you in solitary confinement. He knows the right temperature for your fiery furnace. He knows how many car accidents for you to have to walk away without a scratch. See, God knows how many semesters you need to fail. How long you have to keep your own academic probation. Lean on somebody and say, he knows. He knows, he knows. The process is what? Difficult. See, the process is now in place where God will shape and develop and mold and fine tune and critique our character. See, in the process, God pushes us to our very limits. Then he passes us like silver through the refiner's fire. He bends you to a breaking point. Then he rotates, rotates you from inside out. Ha! And then he said, that's not enough. And because you want them spoiled Christians, he will drag you to hell and back. And then place his seal of approval on you. See, glory to God. Ah, glory to God. See, see, I'm at the end of my message, you know. See, I'm almost out of time. But I want to tell you the process is working for you. See, some of y'all still don't believe me. I said the process is working for you. See, see, I, I, 
I must be amongst some spoiled Christians. So, so let me give you an example. I hold in 2 Corinthians, Paul spoke of a thorn in his flesh. Now he, pr he prayed three times. And Paul asked the Lord to remove this thing. God responded without removing the thorn because he said, my grace is all you need. <laughs> see, see, let's see, see, later Paul, he testified in Romans because it served as a navigational system to his expected end. He, he left this message in Romans 8, 28 where he penned these words in a letter to the Romans. He said what? All things work together for good. So, 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 so please stand up with me and shout. It's in the plan. Come on, stand up and say, the plan is simple, but the process is difficult. See, see, a few years ago, some, only a few people here noticed, a few years ago, I had to have a hysterectomy. I had to have a hysterectomy. It was an emergency hysterectomy. So, when I, when I came out of surgery, I said, um, I don't feel good. Something's not right. Something's not right. They, they gave me an antibiotic, but my body didn't respond to it correctly. So, but I, I kept saying something's not right. So I went home, and I, I'm thankful for my daughter because I said to her, I said, Kenna, Kenna, I don't, I don't feel right. Something's not right. So my baby immediately jumped in the car with me, and, and, and we went to the emergency room as quickly as we could. Now, now, now mind you, this child's only 10 years old when this happened. So, so I, you know, I had to put a lot of, a lot of faith in this little girl. And, and so I, I get there and they, they, they do some tests and they say, ah, oh, she's septic. Ah, so they said, um, she's about to become toxic. And, and, and the doctor started to count me out. Uh, they, 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 they said if they don't get this infection out of me, that I was going to die. And so, see, glory to God, I didn't die. <laughs> They said that they couldn't, they tried to count me out, but it wasn't God's plan. See, my sickness was God's plan. Huh? My suffering was in his plan. My heartache was in his plan. My failure was in his plan. Glory to God, there's going to be some times in your life when people are going to try to count you out. People are going to lie on you. They're going to steal from you. They're going to speak bad on your name, but it's in the plan. It's in the plan. Because see, as God continued to address Paul, only, God said, only when you are weak can everything be done completely by my power. See, 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 y'all don't even know when to shout. But see, see, only when you're weak can everything be done completely in my power. Uh, Bishop, I'm going to close this out. Now, I am. Bishop, I'm going to close this out. See, see, stay on your feet all over the building. Because I want you to know he has a plan for you to the expected end. God's plan is to perfect you by whatever means necessary. He is willing to do whatever it takes. He's going to send you through the fire and through the flood. The expected end is God's expectation of what he wants for you, what he has for you. It is in his plan. Are you ready to receive it? Glory to God.